I will award sanctions if I have to go through the proceeding. The deliberate gamesmanship by defendants. Instead of giving up the battle. I don't play that game with my court. And there's Ms. Gutierrez. All right, so I've got um, a mo well, probably multiple motions here, but motion to quash. Um, this is, uh, I have a note here that the agreement for the Zoom hearing wasn't filed uh, timely by last Friday. And then um, y'all then reached out to my staff. And I'm going to say not in pleasant terms. Um, and um, finally, untimely filed this agreement, I guess, Wednesday, uh, and then um, got irritated with my staff indicating that, well, if, if we don't get it by Zoom, then you will just file an emergency notice for a hearing. Now, let me tell you how this works, counsel, both of you. Um, if you don't comply with our local rules, uh, just by putting on your pleading that it's an emergency hearing will not guarantee that you'll get a hearing. So don't play that game with my court or with my staff, okay? We're not doing that anymore. Don't do it. Follow the rules, listen to my staff, be courteous to my staff because they work with me. And I never, I never wanna hear this again from either, from any council that they have treated my staff poorly. Won't happen. And if you don't think I'm gonna sanction you next time, think again, because when you are rude to my staff, you're being rude to me. So follow the rules, do what we ask you to do very simply so we can get these motions heard timely. And if you're doing it by Zoom, do it under the agreements and, and under the rules that we have under Travis County, okay? Now, let's go on to these hearings. I've got a motion to quash, and I think it's um, for the defendant. So um, you may proceed, counsel. Thank you, Judge Katie Andre for defendants. Uh, the SAFs, this, although this is our motion, we didn't actually set up for hearing, nor did we ask for the emergency hearing. So I just want to apologize to the court for being um, in any way related to um, that situation. This petition was filed back in March of 2024. It's about 20 pages long. It's actually a, a, a tenant landlord dispute, but it has other claims included. This is just for the court's background, including like intrusion of seclusion and some other sort of um, public you know, dissemination of information that Ms. Chambers has has accused Mr. Saft of. Um, running uh, parallel with the civil case are two criminal uh, cases against Ms. Chambers for various issues. One of them has to do with Mr. Saft and her use of a firearm towards him. So that's just kind of gives you the flavor of what we're dealing with here. Um, the very first issue and the actual, the, the only motion that was actually set in front of your honor today was our original motion to quash. Um, that was due to Miss um, Chambers' counsel's insistence for weeks that the plaintiff uh, be able to go second in this lawsuit um, for her deposition. And so without an agreement, uh, plaintiff's counsel noticed Mr. Staff's deposition um, and we quashed it. And that's what the first motion was about. Um, after that time, um, Ms. Gutierrez actually worked out with uh, one of Ms. McGeorge's associates getting deposition state dates exchanged. It did take a little while because of people's availability during November, um, but we were able to come up with some dates. Um, we noticed the plaintiff's deposition, Ms. Chambers, on a date that they provided. Um, we noticed it for in-person um, at our offices, there was no objection to the to the fact that it was going to be at our office. Certainly, we would have gone wherever they wanted us to. Um, they did not like that we wanted to have her deposition in person. As I explained before, there's lots of issues in this case. I, I'm kind of old school. I like to take depositions in person. We insisted on it. That's the way it's been noticed. It's scheduled for Monday. Um, I tell the court that because we offered Mr. Saff's deposition for several dates to follow right? So that the defendant could go second to be on notice of the claim is made against him. And Ms. Coutier has offered um, some dates back on October 17th, including the date of November 11th. Um, she offered three dates, didn't hear anything, followed up the next day. And in response, we got a notice from Mr. Saft on the 18th of, of October for one of those dates, um, but at a location on North Lamar, which is apparently a Regis sharing, you know, one of those conference type places where you can rent a room. 
And Miss Gutierrez immediately responded and said, we're great with the day. That's one of the ones that we, that we offered, but would you please change the location to our office? Because it's our client. And the response that was met, judge, was, um, it was bizarre, but I'll just say this. I jumped in because Ms. Gutierrez was in a deposition. I felt I felt strongly that I've never actually had to argue of having my own client presented at my office ever. Um, and Ms. McGeorge was on the other end of those emails and basically said, this is where we want it. This is where we're going to have it. She's gone to great lengths in her in her. Um, Second motion to quash to tell the court all of the things that that we did wrong, but the fact is, judge, that we wanted just for her to agree to that we could present our client at our office. And so, after several attempts that Friday afternoon, telling Miss McGeorge, if we can't agree, we're going to quash. You know, I don't want to keep going back and forth about, forth about this. Um, we did quash, but for the sake of keeping that date and time, I went ahead and noticed my client's dep- deposition myself for the same day, the same time, but at my office. And the reason that I did that judge is because I thought what Ms. McGeorge is going to tell the court and what she's done in her very long motion is tell the court that we're delaying discovery. I noticed the deposition to keep my client on schedule for his deposition a week after her client. Instead of talking to me about it, instead of giving up the battle of the place of the deposition, she quashed our notice. What's ironic about that, number one, is that her client is going to be appearing at our office for her deposition. So there's nothing wrong with our office. They didn't have an issue with that. But secondly, if she would have left our notice, we would have paid for the depo because that's the way the rules work. And instead, because we're going to die on this hill, she quashed it. So now we're in a situation where we have competing motions to quash uh, for November 11th at 10 o'clock, either on a in a Regis office on North Amar or or in our office, which she'll have visited a week before. Um, that's where we're at. And I hate to even bring the court into the details of this, but I'll just say that if if the court has looked through their motion to quash our notice of our own client, you'll see lots of statements about what we've done and what we haven't done. Um, She's asked for sanctions, which I take personal offense to because I've given every chance to talk about this and it really should not be this contentious at all. It's not my way of practicing law. Um, But I would say as well that I reached out to Ms. McGeorge on Monday and asked, when can we talk? Because she had said that she was in trial when she communicated with your staff. And she, instead of taking me up on it, sent me a very long email telling me every reason why she was right and she was going to get sanctions, et cetera. Again, I do not feel comfortable bringing this to the court, but here we are. Um, I would have been happy to work this out. As far as I'm concerned, the deposition is still on for the 11th at 10 at our office. I drafted an order and submitted it to the court that granted and denied in part, basically granted our motion to quash us to the location but denied our motion to quash, which really kind of makes sense, but it just ordered our client's deposition at that date and time at our legal offices in Austin. Um, There is one thing I wanted to comment on by Ms. McGeorge's uh, affidavit, actually, which is interesting to me that she swore to this, but um, one of her reasons for asking for sanctions is because she's incurred fees and costs associated with um, canceling the deposition. And Ms. McGeorge, if she had to move the, the deposition, Ms. McGeorge included her her emails and receipts from the court reporter and the place that both say that there's no cancellation uh, fee. One of them, I think you can cancel within one day or eight hours of the deposition. The other one you can cancel within by like October or November something. But that's just to say that asking for over $3,000 in sanctions and saying that your staff has spent more than 11 hours on this issue when all it took was a phone call that I offered is a little ridiculous and I take personal offense. So I would ask that the court keep or order the deposition of my client to happen on the 11th at 10 at my office, um, deny the sanctions and allow the case to go forward. Thank you. All right, Ms. McGeorge. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and, uh, just to respond, your honor, um, when, 
we originally filed our response. We filed in the response itself a request for an emergency hearing on this issue. Um, and I have the email pulled up if you'd like to see it. But I think I was more prostrating myself before the court because of the um, missing the deadline on Friday. I was attending CLE training and I was out of the state and my computer died. Um, and so I could not, I, I did not get it in time, but I was really more begging the court to put us back on the docket. At least that was my intention. So I'm sorry if it was taken in any other way. Um, <clears throat> but as to a couple of statements that were just made, um, there's a lot of mischaracterization that happens um, when I'm, we're dealing with defendants' counsel. So I did think it was necessary to get very precise and very detailed and support each and every sentence that we wrote in the motion with the actual proof of it. Um, for example, in her opening, she stated just a moment ago that it was plaintiff's insistence that she goes second. And all of the emails submitted in response with our motion uh, or in our motion response uh, show you that it's actually the opposite. There are umpteen and repeated refusals by Ms. Gutierrez to provide, even provide dates, even after we had provided dates of our client, they still refused to provide dates. Um, and, and they were the ones actually and expressly writing in the emails that they would not provide dates until there were uh, there was a scheduled deposition and our client went first. So we agreed to that. And we provided those dates. And then you'll see in the timeline, they still refuse to provide dates after that. So it feels a lot like if it wasn't this objection, it would be something else. Um, there's also a mischaracterization of my testimony in my unsworn deck. I talk about uh, I talk about fees in the sense of all fees, including legal time that it takes to call and reschedule and the fees my clients would have to pay, not just hard costs. Um, and that also in the receipt that I provided, it does state that the Regis conference room we booked for this purpose is not refundable after October 28th. And so as we stand here today, there is in fact 450-ish dollars that will be hard costs on this case if it gets moved. I had to leave it there because a motion to quash only stays the deposition. It doesn't cancel it. And it needed to be available if and when we were able to lift the stay. So it's these kinds of little mischaracterizations that led us to have to go to such great lengths to show this court exactly what is happening in this case. So plaintiff's response seeks to uphold the scheduled deposition and prevent further undue delays by the defendants in this case, whose objections lack both factual and procedural foundation under the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Uh, defendants' motion fails to demonstrate any unreasonable hardship, cost, or inconvenience. And that evidence needs to be in the motion record in order for the court to grant the motion to quash. Instead, these motions reveal a pattern of gamesmanship, which seems like they are intended solely to obstruct and delay, as opposed to just getting this case moved forward. So Rule 199.2, Section B2 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, specifies that a deposition location is expressly reasonable if, if it's within the county of the witness's residence, and we've attached proof that the witness lives in Austin, Texas, um, and uh, the county where the suit, or sorry, or the county where the suit is filed, and that's Travis County, which is also where the deposition is noticed. Plaintiff's selected location, which is within 12 miles of defense counsel's office, is well within the Travis County borders and fully meets the reasonableness rule of the, of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. And despite this, defendants' counsel objected to our notice solely based on what seems to be their preference for a different location without offering any evidence at all um, to on their motion, nothing is authenticated. There is no actual evidence on their motion, uh, but not to mention evidence that would prove hardship, cost, or inconvenience. They don't even have a sentence in there that argues that there's hardship, cost, or inconvenience to defend it. 
This lack of substantive objection underscores the baseless nature of the motion, which appears intended to delay rather than address any legitimate concerns. There's um, several, as I mentioned before, mischaracterizations um, in their motion. An example of a false implication include that we initially claimed these non-refundable fees in scheduling. Uh, we, we did note that there would be costs incurred by our client for rescheduling because um, somebody, me or somebody on my staff, will have to engage and pick up the phone and call the court reporter, reschedule the location, do all of these things. And so, yes, we did reference that there would be costs to the client for doing so um, when this location is patently reasonable under the rules. So um, due to the defendant's repeated and motions to quash and baseless motions, we've now actually incurred approximately 450 in non-refundable fees to secure the conference room, which needed to be canceled by October 28th um, in order to avoid cancellation fees. And so as we sit here, plaintiff will incur hard costs. Um, the motion from the defendants also inaccurately asserts that the selected deposition location is not plaintiff's office without any basis or knowledge for such a statement. In reality, the location is a Regis office location, and we've held a membership there for since 2016. And we do this for access to larger conference spaces as needed, as our current Tillery office location lacks suitable facilities for larger parties. Um, and we're actually in the process of relocating this for a full time uh, pursuant to a two year contract we have. So it's a misrepresentation to the court that the location is not our office. And I don't know what defendants have based their statement to the contrary on exactly. But regardless, the Texas rules of civil procedure don't require that depositions occur, occur only in law offices. The rules require that they occur in reasonable places. Um, and I've even held them in the free deposition rooms that some court reporters provide with their services. But in my experience, the party noticing the deposition, since they have a duty to put an address on there, they are typically the one that hosts the deposition in their space, um, which is why when they offer, when they wanted to take our client's deposition and they wanted to take it in their law office, we didn't raise an objection. We didn't have a problem with it. Um, we did state that she would prefer to arrive by Zoom because there is an order of protection and she has to leave her home with personal security each time to ensure her physical safety. So we did request that accommodation. It was declined. And then we agreed to produce our client in person. We also noticed them that there would be a personal security officer present with our client at the deposition. And they immediately wrote back with more objections and saying that, you know, we don't allow guns in our space. And so to avoid having this problem in the future um, and, and the rules and things that they wanna have in their own private office, which is fine, we have noticed it for a space that is reasonable under the rules. Um, and that fits the definition of 199.2B2. Um, defendant's lack of evidence or substantiated claims of unreasonable hardship, cost, or inconvenience of any kind further demonstrates that the motion lacks merit. This deficiency contravenes Rule 13, which, which requires factual accuracy and good faith filings, highlighting the motion's lack of legitimate procedural basis. We, we have rules and the rules matter. And, um, and so when it comes to this kind of thing, as long as we've done some, what is reasonable under the rules and there is no valid objection raised for hardship or un, undue, bird, undue costs, um, there is no reason for us to go through the rigmarole of moving the location. Um, 192.6a um, requires a party filing a motion to quash to suggest an alternate date or location to facilitate the deposition without unnecessary delay. Defendant's counsel, there are two motions to quash filed of the deposition for Jeffrey Saft. In the first motion that defendants filed quashing it in September, the defendant's counsel entirely ignored this requirement, providing only objections without proposing any alternative, leaving plaintiff with no choice but to await a hearing date 
while it repeatedly and continuously attempted to request agreed upon dates with the defendants. When the clerk finally proposed dates for the hearing, defendants counsel took an additional 10 days to respond to the clerk's email and then was inconveniently unavailable for all, for all but the very latest possible date today, October 31st. And that's two full months after the plaintiff first began requesting dates for this deposition. When plaintiffs were finally able to obtain dates from the defendants, it should be noted that there were four or five days that lead counsel, who's my associate attorney, Stephanie Rivera, said she would not be available in November. And again, inconveniently, the only suggested dates offered by defendants in offering their client for deposition were these exact same dates that the lead counsel in this case stated she was unavailable. We didn't want any further delays, so that necessitated me stepping in to help with the deposition since she will be out of the office during those dates. Then, even though we have an agreed upon date and time, defendants again file a second motion to quash the deposition, raising only these unfounded and baseless objections with no proof attached to support its claims. The deliberate gamesmanship by defendants contributed to significant and unnecessary delays in the discovery process, and it further demonstrates defendants' intent to obstruct rather than facilitate these proceedings. Further, the lack of procedural compliance uh, in their motions in failing to suggest an alternate date in the first motion and in failing to show or prove up any hardship, costs, or inconvenience upon which defendant's motion is pro would be properly based exemplifies a misuse of the court's resources and an intentional delay tactic in the discovery process. Um, the pattern of the delays is shown in very explicit detail in our motion, but to highlight we began requesting deposition September 1st. And then um, instead of giving us dates, you can see in the exhibits that defendants were responding with objections and preconditions like, we will only provide dates if your client provides dates first, rather than cooperative scheduling. If our emails to them included a request for dates to depose their client and then also some other piece of information, they would only respond to the portion of the email about that other information and completely ignore and sometimes outright. Yeah, so you remember I told you I read all this, right? You remember I, I told yes. you that before we start. No yes, need to right. go over everything all over again. Absolutely okay. no need. So just this ongoing cycle of delays, Your Honor, um, we are requesting sanctions because Rule 215 are warranted to address these kinds of abuses and to deter further obstruction. Um, and defendants' repeated re procedural violations and mischaracterizations and delay tactics have forced the plaintiff to incur significant additional legal expenses, which are detailed in my unsworn declaration. Uh, the motion was 19 pages long, and so um, that is the reason for the amount of time and and that was incurred for the fees. So in light of the defendant's failure to substantially th substantiate any claims of hardship, cost, or inconvenience, as well as the location fitting squarely within the rules, we're asking the court to deny the defendant's motion to quash our notice of deposition and to lift the stay and to order the deposition to proceed on November 11th at 10 a.m. at the 3800 North Lamar uh, location where it's been noticed. We're also asking um, for the court to award attorney's fees to deter, deter further delay tactics and uphold procedural integrity. Thank you. Is there anything else, Ms. Andre? Anything else? I'm not going to waste the court's time. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, here's my observation after reading all this. Um, there, um, let, let me first address one thing. It wasn't really an apology to, to the court that you started out with, uh, Ms. McGeorge. I'm not going to take it as such. Number two, um, as I review the pattern of behavior here, you're lucky I'm not giving sanctions 
to the defendants for your acts and your firm's acts. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to deny the sanctions. This all required you to pick up a phone, dial or digitize, whatever, and to see if it was okay, the date, the time, location. It is courtesy. It is professional. Um, it's how we practice law in Texas, in Travis County, and even in Dallas County. You present your witness generally at your office. I To go through this whole rigmarole and spending this amount of time and, and making your client pay all these fees to have this argument seems to be misplaced. So the motion to quash by the defendants is granted. You will have the deposition on November 11th at the defendant's offices, law firm's offices. I don't want to see y'all again on something like this. I will award sanctions if I have to go through this again. I don't know who's mentoring who on the plaintiff side, but you better think again how you how you present yourself to this court because I'm I am really unhappy and disappointed that I'm having that I even had to read all this. Absolutely unnecessary. I expect bigger and better things because I've seen it from y'all. And I'm I am really, really disappointed seeing this. So I'm gonna sign Ms. Andre's orders. Um Get the deposition done. Be courteous to one another. Don't let this hang over you, but just get the case done. It's don't take it personal. Just do the work, get it done. And I want to, I don't want to see y'all again. Okay. Have a great Halloween. Y'all are excused. Understood. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Y'all doing okay? We good? All right, let's do 24-3173, Al-Sadi versus uh, Be Good. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and stick around. YouTube's picked out some more videos it knows you'll love.